Jesus. How powerful is his name? Is his name. And we thank him. Let's pray as we prepare to hear from our great God. Father, we thank you so much for what you are doing in each and every one of our lives. We praise you because you are the one who sustains us through every obstacle of life. We praise you, God, because you have commissioned each and every one of your children to accomplish the goals that you've set before us in our ministries to you and to the lost and dying world. So we thank you, God, because we know that you are the one who strengthens us and causes us to be able to fulfill your will, your perfect will in our finiteness and our limitations because you provide everything that is needed and necessary for us to do that. So Lord, as we come to your word, receiving from you the encouragement that we need to finish what we've started, God, to finish what we've started for you. So we bless your name and thank you for building us up by your word. Oh, we confess our sins as we come before you, covered by the blood of Jesus and in his righteousness. And we thank you so much for your forgiveness and your cleansing. Will you, Lord, walk us through your, your word because we do need your encouragement. In Christ's name do we pray. Amen. So we are beginning a new series today, and our new series will be Finish What You Have Started. Finish what you have started. Now, now we know that finishing what has been started uh, uh, requires the power of God to be accomplished. Yes, yes. There is nothing in and of ourselves that causes us to be able to do anything. It is all God's provisions and his power of, that are part of his plan for us. And so as we come to this study on finish what you have started, we're going to ask the Lord for, again, his encouragement and then just to reveal to us, share with us some encouraging words that describe several lives of, of the saints that we are aware of in their ministry to God. And so we are looking forward to that as we endeavor to find out what it takes to finish what we've started. You know, there's a phrase that's used, and it, the phrase is, don't start what you can't finish. All right. Now that phrase intimates to us that there is a lack of capability or ability that one has to finish what they've started to its completion. Mm -hmm. I would like to propose a slight modification to that phrase. All right. That modification now is don't start mm -hmm. what you won't finish. All right. <laughs> now, this implies that my finishing what God has given to me is not because or is not due to capability uh -huh. or ability. Yes. And my choosing to not finish is not due to a lack of capability or ability, but it is a choice that I make in not finishing what God has given me to start yes. and to bring to completion. Mm -hmm. Now, some start their education mm -hmm. and choose not to complete it. All right. We know that there are many circumstances that 
would hinder or or not allow one to finish something that they've started in the area of education. However, there are those who choose not to finish. Then some men make babies and choose not to raise them. Some choose to get married and then choose not to finish or bring that marriage to completion where we know that the Lord says that you are together till death do you part. And some start to serve Christ and choose not to serve him to completion. And God says that when you and I are given an assignment or the assignment by him, to minister or to serve him and others where we are, then choosing to complete that wonderful assignment is something that he desires for us to do. Because when we choose to complete that wonderful, wonderful assignment of his, then he empowers us and gives us everything that's needed in order for us to do that. Now, I must know and realize that I have the power availed to me by Christ Jesus. Philippians 4.13 tells us, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So everything that I need in order to accomplish God's goal, everything that I need to accomplish God's assignment is availed to me by Christ because the scripture tells us that I can accomplish these things, I can do all things through Christ who provides the strength. It is not in my human capability, it's not in my human ability because I am finite yeah. and have great limitations. But no matter what God assigns to you and I, how difficult it may appear, how complex it may come off to be, God says that he is the one who will provide what is needed in order for us to bring it to completion. Now I use the word us or you and I not to take on any responsibility beyond the responsibility of submitting to the power of God. I don't want to give the impression that my success or your success or our bringing something to completion that we've started according to God's assignment is due to my capability or your capability. Mm -hmm. But God says that he wants us to finish or bring to completion that which we have started. And by saying that he, he identifies with us that we are involved, but he is the one who accomplishes all things. So let's look at the life of one today who was encouraged by God throughout his life and shares with us the beauty that is associated with doing ministry for God. The beauty that's associated with working on behalf of God. Now, I want us to remember that this duty or assignment is not just regulated to someone preaching or someone espousing on the word of God. These assignments from God run the gamut because he has placed each and every one of us in positions 
that touch the lives of people that touch the lives of those who don't even know him by various assignments, by various tasks that he's given us to do so that we can share the gospel of life. In the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4, we are going to look at Paul's life a moment, and we're going to look at the end of Paul's life. This being the end of Paul's life, he, in the book of 2 Timothy, gives his final charge or his final encouragement to his protege, his son in the faith, young Timothy. Paul is at the end of his, his life, and that's going to become very apparent to us as we read the word, but he gives his final charge to Timothy, the young minister. Now, he tells Timothy that there should be a commitment from him to preach God's word no matter what the situation is and no matter who his audience is. He is encouraged by Paul to preach no matter what the circumstances are and to do this in season or out of season in season and out of season whether or not the times are suitable or whether the times are not suitable he encourages timothy because timothy being a young minister has experienced some hesitation some fears because of the enormity of the ministry because of the responsibility of the ministry but, but paul because he had been through so much was able to encourage Timothy with this final charge or the last words of a condemned and dying man. These were words that were important to him and these were words that he saw fitting to give to Timothy again, who was his young protege in the faith. Now in verse six, where we are going to look at Paul's final exhortation and encouragement to Timothy, we understand that Paul is in a Roman prison. And he's in a Roman prison for the second time. The first time that we find Paul in a Roman prison was approximately five years earlier. And being in Rome, being a Roman prisoner at that time, Paul was a house prisoner. You know, he was regulated to his home, and that's where they kept Paul. You can say in the comforts of his home, but he was still a prisoner. Yeah, yeah. This time we see that Paul being in prison in Rome is of much more dire circumstances. Mm -hmm. We see that Paul being in prison is now in a Roman dungeon, not only in a Roman dungeon, but in an inner dungeon. Mm -hmm. Meaning that this location that were, where, where Paul is being kept called the lower chamber is cold and damp, mm -hmm. dark, repulsive, and terrible. Mm -hmm. So Paul is in a circumstance of life that is what you and I would call dreaded. He's in this Roman dungeon, but Paul is not doing anything or thinking about anything but his prior service to God. And in that prior service, utilizing those experiences to encourage the young minister Timothy in his current ministry. Paul's in prison. He's at the hands of the enemy. He's in the dungeon and it is a repulsive circumstance of life. This man is on his last days and he's not spending his last days in a situation or a condensed condition that you and I would typically desire or desire for ourselves. He is in the dungeon. He is in a circumstance that speaks of his imminent death. He says in verse 6, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering. So Paul 
is telling Timothy, Timothy, I'm on my last moment. I am already being poured out as a drink offering my life is being poured out be before god my life has been poured out before god and timothy i want you to know the joy that i have because of what god has done in me and through me although i'm in the dungeon because this drink offering is where during the festival of first fruits Paul is reflecting on this, understanding the festivals and everything that goes on or went on in the Jewish festivals. Paul is remembering what the drink offering symbolized. Yes. He says that the drink offering, which is poured out on the grain offering and it's mixed together, the drink offering being a libation or wine poured out into the grain offering is a symbol of joy. So Paul says that I'm at the end of my life, but I have nothing but joy, no matter what my circumstance is right now, no matter what I have been through in the past, I am experiencing the joy of God. And not only that, I want to bring God joy because as the sacrifice offerings were given to God, here we know that the Drink offering symbolizes joy. Yeah, yeah. So Paul says, no matter what I'm going through, and no matter what you're going through, I'm at the end of my life, Paul says, but I want to make sure that God knows, that I know, that I have not experienced anything but joy, and I'm experiencing joy right now, although I'm at the hands of the enemy. He says, and the time of my departure or the time of my death is at hand. The time of Paul's death is at hand. Paul knew that he was about to be executed by the Romans. He knew that he was in his last moments because he was getting ready to be subjected to a terrible torture and a a execution by the Romans. But Paul is again in the mindset that I'm going to encourage this one. I have great joy in the midst of my circumstance. I know it. I want God to know it. I want you to know it. That's why I'm saying to you, Timothy, that I'm poured out like a drink offering. Timothy, you can identify with a drink offering. You know what I'm saying. Paul tells us to understand what he's saying because in the midst of what he's going through, he is always desiring to please God. So Paul says further that the time of my departure is at hand, but you know what? When I depart, I'm going to be free. Right. Paul says I'm in this dungeon. I'm, I'm in the hands of the enemy. I'm in the hands of the Romans who have persecuted me, who have mistreated me, who have tortured me. But you know, since I'm about to leave this planet, because my departure is intimate, I am about to be free. Paul says that is a note for you and I as believers that no matter what we are going through, death is not the end. We don't have to consider death as the end, but death as the beginning of freedom. Yes. Paul says, I'm going to be free. Now, he says this with full confidence. He goes on and he tells us some things about his past in verse 7. Now, Paul says that I have fought the good fight. Or I have fought the fight that is worth fighting. I have fought the fight that is noble. Yeah. I have fought the fight that has value. I have not just fought a fight or fights out of selfishness or selfish reasons or fights that have no value in the outcome being one where I've won. I fought the noble fight. Yeah. I fought the worthy fight. Now, what is this noble and worthy fight that Paul is talking about? Paul says the fight is for the souls of men. Oh. Paul says that I've given myself to God. I've given myself to this worthy, noble fight because the souls of men are at stake. Yeah. And that's the fight that's worth fighting. My enemies' souls 
are at stake. My friends' souls are at stake. The haters of God, their souls are at stake. All the souls are at stake, and this is what I've been giving myself to. No matter where I am in God's assignment, my perspective is always from the vantage point that the souls are at stake. Yeah. Yeah. No matter what my profession is, no matter what my calling is, the souls are at stake. And this is the worthy fight that I have been fighting. Now he says further with full confidence, he says, I have finished the race. I have finished the race. But the race has had obstacles. The race has had obstructions. The race has had difficulties, but nevertheless, I have Finish the race. There's this race that's called the steeplechase. Uh-huh. And the steeplechase <clears throat> race takes place over a course of 3,000 meters. Uh-huh. And along this steeplechase, there are obstacles yeah. that have to be gotten over uh-huh. and through. The obstacles are in forms of hurdles. So while the one who is running on the steeplechase, he or she gets to an obstacle, a hurdle, and has to get over it, has to leap over it, has to jump over it and still keep stride to the next obstacle. Because the next obstacle is coming because that's the, that's the design of the race. And there are not only hurdles on the steeplechase course, there are, there are also water pits on the steeplechase course. Now, when I get to the water pit, the water pit is designed to slow me down and make me fall. The water pit is designed to take me out of the race so that I cannot finish the race. But the water pit, if I get through it, it propels me to the next hurdle. And when I get over that hurdle, it propels me to the next hurdle. So Paul says that I'm in this race, but the obstacles, I'm seeing them not as obstacles or not as hindrances. I am seeing these as instruments of propelling me forward. So that I can get to the next obstacle because I know it's coming because God says that I am in a race. Now, something else about this race that Paul says he's in, and oh, by the way, that you and I are in, is a race that has no competitors. All the others who are in the race are just fellow runners. And they are not in competition with me in the assignment that God has given to me in this race. And I am not in competition with them, Paul says. We are fellow runners who have the same purpose, that purpose being the worthy fight where the souls are at stake. Now, Paul didn't say that he won the race because it says here, I have finished the race. Now, Paul says that I am not concerned about winning the race. I am concerned about being faithful in the race. I am concerned about finishing the race, not looking at the folks on the side of me because they are my competitors. The obstacles that are in front of me are the obstacles that I have to get over and run through. They propel me to the next obstacle, although the structure is to is designed to hinder me. God says that the perspective that you and I have, as be, since we belong to him, is to see that we are on assignment. Yeah, yeah. No matter where we are, no matter what we are doing, we are in a race mm-hmm. to finish. Yeah. And I choose to finish the race. 
It is not because of lack of capability. Mm -hmm. It is not because of lack of ability. Right. It is not because of any circumstances that exist while I'm in the race. Right, make it plan. Make it plan. It is all due to the power of God yeah. Yeah. in me working in me and through me, providing all that I need in order for me to finish the race. Mm -hmm. He says that you need to be faithful yeah. in what God has assigned you. He says that don't choose to fall away. Yeah. Don't choose to take your hand right. off the plot. Right. Don't choose to say, I'm not going to go and show up any longer. Yeah. Don't choose to say, I'm not going to be in devotion any longer. Yeah. Don't choose to say, I'm not going to be in worship any longer. Yeah. Don't choose to say, I am not going to serve Christ any longer. Yeah. Yeah. He says, you and I are in a race. And he's not looking for winners. The race is already won. He's looking for faithful ones who trust him completely, who depend upon him totally, so that we can finish the race. Now, Paul gives us an idea when the race finishes. He said when he, when he dies. Right. Paul says, I'm going to be in this race. I'm going to run this race. I'm going to attack these obstacles. I'm going to run through these obstacles until the day I die. So if someone has a thought about when the race concludes, then Paul makes it clear for us. The race concludes when the Lord brings you home. Yeah, yeah. Because it is not about being in a pulpit. It's not about being some preacher of the word. It's about being a saint All of right. God. Mm -hmm. Where you are, you are on assignment. No matter what you are doing, you are on assignment. So God tells us through Paul to be encouraged. Now, Paul says that also he has kept the faith yeah. in verse 7. Okay, so I finished the race, and while I was running, I kept the faith. Paul says he never stopped telling people about the gospel of life. Right. He never was shaken by what's going on in the culture, who's in the White House, who is protesting, who's not protesting, whether or not I have this, whether or not they have that. Paul says the priority one, yeah. the most important thing in the entire universe because souls are at stake is the keeping of the faith. There is no reason or cause for the gospel of God to be minimized and not a part of right. the picture right. and the conversation that his children are having. This speaks to our Christian experience. When one has this particular Christian experience, being the love of souls, so much so that I am going to give the souls the gospel of life, that is an experience of a Christian that validates, contributes to the validation that I belong to Christ. Because I am sharing the gospel, I am living out the gospel yeah. in, a, in the midst of a lost and dying world no matter where I am no matter what I'm doing. Paul says he kept the faith. Now, Paul goes on and he tells us that he looks to his future. Now, Paul in the dungeon. Yeah, yeah. Paul about to be executed. Mm -hmm. Why are you, Paul, looking to the future? Paul, according to man's definition, you have no future. According to man's perspective, you have no future. You on death row, Paul. Uh -huh. Ain't nothing left for you. You about to be dead and gone, Paul. But Paul said, no, I have a future. And this future is what causes me to have joy. He says in verse 8, finally, yeah, yeah. or in the future, there is 
laid up for me mm -hmm. or reserved for me, mm -hmm. he calls it a crown. Mm -hmm. Now, this crown is given to the victor. Yeah. This crown is given to the one who, who wins. Yeah. This crown is given as a reward to that one who has finished the race. Right. This one receives the crown because he didn't allow the obstacles right. to right. deter them. The obstacles propelled yeah. me. The obstacles have not caused me to lay down. The obstacles have caused me to stand up. Paul says that I am going to receive a crown that is laid up for me, that is reserved for me, and this crown is called the crown of righteousness. Mm. Now, Paul says, I got a future waiting for me, mm -hmm. whether folks believe it or not. And I know I have a future waiting for me because I belong to Jesus. And I know that I have a future waiting for me because the word of God says it. So no matter what the circumstances say, no matter what man's perspective is, I know that I have for me a crown of righteousness, which is, it says, which the Lord, the righteous judge. So now Paul says that he is not judged by unrighteous men yes. because he's in the hands of the Romans. He is about to be executed by the unrighteous. So he says that those are not the folks that I'm concerned with. I'm concerned with the righteous judge. Because, see, the righteous judge knows my estate. The righteous judge knows who I am. And I know who the righteous judge is. He says the righteous judge is going to give me this crown. And the righteous judge will give me this crown on that day. Oh, there's a day coming where you and I will receive the rewards from the righteous judge. And Paul says, that's my future. That's what I'm looking forward to. That's what I know is coming. And while I'm in this dungeon, this dungeon is nothing. Oh, it is terrible. The dungeon is trepid. The, the, the dungeon is, is full of stank. The dungeon is where no one should be kept or uh, chained and being held, the dungeon is no place for anyone, but as long as I'm in this dungeon, he says, I know who I belong to and what my future holds. So because I have a future outlook, yeah. I am able to consider my present in a different light because my future holds greatness, yeah. even though my presence is a bunch of trouble. My future holds greatness. My future holds glory. He says, but in, right now, immediately, it's a bunch of trouble. Yeah. But I'm still good. I'm full of joy, he says. Yeah. Now, he says, the righteous judge is going to award me on that day, which is the great day, which is the Lord's day, where all the saints of God will be rewarded. He says, but not only me. Uh -huh. Paul is always concerned about somebody else. Yeah. Paul is always concerned about other folk. Paul is sitting in the dungeon, and he's not all concerned about himself. Paul is in a dire circumstance, and he's not just concerned about himself. Paul says, it's not only waiting for me, catch a clue, it's also waiting for those, he says, who love and who have loved his appearance. Do you love in anticipation right. the appearing of Christ? Right. Or do you dread it? Right. Because if you love it, then you know who you belong to. Mm. But if you dread it, you know who you belong to. He says love is appearing All right. because you have a crown of righteousness waiting for you because you run the race. You have not been deterred. You have not been distracted. You have continued to serve God faithfully. The circumstances don't dictate to you and I what we're going to do. Only God does that. Paul says that I am poured out as a drink offering full of joy. 
desiring to bring joy to the Lord. Yes, he's coming soon. Won't you look for his appearing? Won't you look for it? No matter what situation that you're in right now, he says you're on assignment. And your life is a testimony. You're on assignment. He says he's coming soon, no doubt. That great day is coming. He's coming soon. Yes. The race that you're in, we know. God knows there are difficulties, there are obstacles. He knows that there are hurdles that you have to jump. He knows that there are water pits that you have to run through. He knows that. God has designed the race course. God has designed the circumstances. Paul loved God. Paul had a great ministry for God. Paul communicated the saving grace of Jesus Christ to multitudes. And he was faithful. Paul found himself in a dungeon. He found himself in a dungeon just so that you and I could be encouraged by his testimony. God is wonderful. So whatever your condition is, it is under the mighty hand of God that you are there. Don't forget it. Don't lose sight of his coming soon. You may be wondering what it takes to be saved, Pastor Mark. I, I, I want to be the Lord's child. Not only in creation, but I want to be the Lord's child in salvation. Pray this prayer with me, repeating after me, and if you believe it in your heart, God will save you in response to your prayer of help. Father, I know that I am unable to save myself, and I know that my life has been one where it has not pleased you because there is nothing that I can do to please you, Lord. There is no work, there are no works, there are no ways that please you without the Savior. And I ask you to save me because I trust the Savior. I trust in Jesus Christ who died on the cross for my sins, who was buried on the third day, was raised to eternal glory. I trust Christ for the price being paid, him being the price for my sins. And Lord, now that you saved me, will you live in me and through me so that I can run this race to the finish, always serving you. In the name of Jesus, amen. If you believe that prayer, you are saved. The word says it. It's not me saying it. And no one can deny what the word says. Read the word and it will validate that you are saved. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Welcome to the family of God. And we thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us. And we look forward to our time together next week as we continue in this series of Finish What You Start. dominion and power both now and forever. God's people said amen. God bless you. We love you. Blessings to you.